singing hymn. Let us begin by singing hymn 427 in the cross of Christ thy glory. God. And 
the sky above that proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their works to the ends of the world. In Comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. His rising is from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from his heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure and enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is plain, enduring forever. And just decrees the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Thousands of 
love those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You, or your son, or your daughter, your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading for us this morning, we were across in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 18 to 31, starting with the 18th verse. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. 
St. John, the second chapter, verses 13 to 22.
today's invitation comes to us from the Epistle lesson. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Serve these words written by St. Paul, the blessed apostle, on the inspiration of the Spirit. We might convene what this orientation is, God's wisdom. You and I live in a world that is filled with opposites. North from south, east from west, in from out, up from down, light to darkness, light to black. So too, when it comes to wisdom, God's wisdom is way over here on one side of the spectrum, and man's wisdom is way over here on the other side of the spectrum, and they are complete opposites. Our God's wisdom includes all things that he has made, visible and invisible. Focusing and centering upon him as a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with Jesus the Savior, and all the holy things for God's holy people. God's wisdom is wide, worldwide. Man's wisdom is the exact opposite, and man's wisdom is narrow, laser beam narrow. According to man's wisdom, there is no such thing as our triune God. So throw our triune God away and Jesus as Savior away. According to the wisdom of the world, there is no such thing as sin. You got your rights and wrongs, I got my rights and wrongs, and they change according to the circumstances of life. And so, since there is no such thing as sin, there is no such thing also as forgiveness of sins. So throw away the sacraments. Throw away the sacrament of baptism. Throw away the sacrament of holy absolution. Throw away the sacrament of holy communion. And since there is no God, throw away God's word. It is on the same level as the book Hansel and Gretel. And while you're throwing holy things away for God's holy people, throw away prayer and throw away Lord's Prayer. Which is one of the reasons why in many public schools we are not allowed to pray the Lord's Prayer. Man's wisdom is over here, God's wisdom is over here, and they are complete opposites. St. Paul picks up on that in the Epistle lesson. Day. St. Paul goes on to remind us that on purpose our God will use those things that are foolish to put to shame the wise of the fallen and broken world. On purpose he will use those things that are lowly and humble and weak to put to shame the strong. On purpose he will use that which is not to nullify that which is. God's wisdom is over here. It's the complete opposite of man's wisdom over here. This brings us to the gospel lesson for today. In the gospel lesson for today, we find God's wisdom colliding with man's wisdom. In the gospel lesson for today, we find our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ cleansing the temple. He was in Jerusalem during the celebration of the Passover meal. The feast of Passover was a pilgrim feast. And because it was a pilgrim feast, it meant that if you were a Jew, 
no matter where you live in the world, no matter where you live in Israel, you must make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover in and by the temple of God. So all these Jews came into Jerusalem from all over the world to celebrate the Passover. And as they did so, they followed the words of Moses. Moses commanded that every year the Jews celebrate the Passover. Every year, a family unit must buy one lamb. Male, one year old, without blush. That lamb must be slain at twilight on Monday, Thursday. That lamb must be used for the family unit to celebrate the Seder Passover meal, where they remember our God as being the great deliverer and rescuer. The God who delivered their forefathers from their enemies of Egypt, and peril and slavery. And as they celebrated the Passover meal, they were to eat this Passover lamb. After the end of the Babylonian captivity under King Cyrus, the Jews were allowed to come back to Israel and back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. As they rebuilt the temple, they built it in such a way as the temple being over here, and the animals that had to be sacrificed according to the laws of Moses over here. And they were fairly far apart. For the passing of time, however, there, came, there became more and more temple Pharisees. And as they grew in number, they also grew in influence. And what they did was they moved the animals to be sacrificed closer and closer to the temple for the convenience of the Jews, God's holy people. And every time they moved it one step closer, they also jacked up the prices even more. The temple Pharisees were pretty smart and filled with man's wisdom. Because what they had figured out was, because of the laws of Moses, these animals must be sacrificed. Life must be taken. Blood must be poured out upon the altar of God. Give thanks to the Lord for his gifts and blessings and benefits and for the forgiveness of sins. So the temple Pharisees, filled with God's wisdom, figured out a way to make it a money-making machine. What they did was they were the ones who owned all the animals to be sacrificed. And as they moved the animals closer and closer to the temple, Finally, they moved it inside the temple. And because there was some festivals like Passover, where you had Jews coming in from other countries who spoke different languages, who had a different currency, there was also a law that only Jewish money could be spent in the temple and used in the temple. And so the temple Pharisees, they created their own bank for currency exchange. Of course, to exchange currency, there was a hefty fee accompanied with it. How smart the temple Pharisees were, using the wisdom of men, taking the Jewish requirements of God's people according to the laws of Moses and making it into a money-making machine. So too, the temple Pharisees did this. They were the religious leaders of God's holy people. They themselves were steeped into works righteousness and self-righteousness. And they taught, they believed and they taught the people, if you want to be saved, you must keep outwardly the Ten Commandments. You must keep outwardly the 600 and some man-made rules and regulations of the parasitic code. And in doing this, they did not teach the people well, by the way, all those lambs that were slaughtered during Passover, all those animals that were sacrificed in the temple by the Levitical priest, having life taken and blood poured out upon the altar of God, they all pointed to Jesus, the Savior, the Lamb of God, life taken, blood poured out upon the wooden altar of the cross, so God's people could have forgiveness 
and life and salvation. The result of all this was a lot of the Jews were doing all this stuff because they knew they had to do it because they were a Jew and they had to follow the laws of Moses. Having no idea why they were doing it in the first place. A lot of them were just going through the motions. A lot of them thought that by doing these good works, they could buy our God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and salvation through their own good works and their own works righteousness. And they had no clue that all pointed to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, in the Gospel lesson for today, during the celebration of Passover, we find Jesus filled with the seal of God, cleansing the temple. He turned over the tables of the money changers who were exchanging the currency. He got a whip and he drove out of the temple the money changers and even some of the animals that were being sold for the Passover. And then he screamed at the top of his voice to the temple Pharisees, What are you doing to my father's house? How dare you do this to my father's house? My father's house is to be a place of worship and prayer. But you have turned it into a multi-million dollar money-making machine. How dare you do that? What you're doing is wrong. But some of the devil Pharisees got up to Jesus and looked at him and they asked him questions like this. Who do you think you are? What do you think you are doing? Who gave you the authority to do these things? We demand a sign showing your authority. And Jesus said, you want a sign? Here is the sign. Destroy this temple, and in three days I shall rise it up again. The devil Pharisees, because they had no faith, they couldn't understand that Jesus was talking about himself. They thought that he was talking about the physical temple. So in the gospel lesson for today, we find the wisdom of God colliding the wisdom of man. And now it comes down to you. And now it comes down to me. In the words of St. Paul the Apostle in the epistle lesson for today, our God is a God of love. Love is the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. We have John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. As we see Jesus, the Lamb of God, going to the cross, giving up all of his life and body and blood, we see the great love of our Heavenly Father, that he would sacrifice his Son to save other children of other people, me and every one of you. We have the words of Jesus, the Lamb of God, in the Gospels, where Jesus says, No greater love is one out for another than lay down their life for them so they can be saved. That's what Jesus, the Lamb of God, did for me. That's what Jesus, the Lamb of God, did for you. That's what Jesus, the Lamb of God, did for the entire world. He gave it all up, all of his life, all of his body, all of his blood, for life and forgiveness salvation for all. And that's the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is the life and death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As you and I look at the fallen, broken world in which we live, we find that there are other gods besides our gods. And so the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. One either worships our God, Yahweh, the triumph God, out of some of my spirit, or they don't. And if they don't, they are worshiping one of the false gods of this life in this world. And those false gods are angry and demanding gods. They demand that their followers, that their followers are going to have to buy their love, their grace, their mercy, their forgiveness of sins, and salvation. And it depends upon 
None but our God has done for us. And so when I look at our God, the great love of God the Father sacrificing His Son, the great love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, going to the cross and giving Him all that He had, all of His life and all of His body and His blood, they just don't get it. It does not compute. They don't understand because they're operating with the wisdom of men in the fallen, broken world. According to the wisdom of men in the fallen, broken world, if you want it, you're going to have to work for it, you're going to have to earn it, and you're going to have to buy it. So St. Paul tells us in the Epistle lesson for today, we preach Christ crucified, falling to those who are perishing. A stumbling block to the Jews that demand a sign, and for the Greeks that demand wisdom. Man's wisdom, not God's wisdom. But the power of God for our salvation. So you and I can have faith, forgiveness of sins, and salvation. So as you and I look at Jesus dying upon the cross, being raised again on the third day, Ascending 40 days after that. That's the wisdom of God. Jesus is the wisdom of God. The very focus of our faith, the very center of our faith, that which gives to us forgiveness and salvation. In the Old Testament, we have the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, the wisdom of God is found in the word Hopam. Hopam has some specific parts to it. It means to read God's word, to hear God's word, to understand God's word, to live God's word. That is God's wisdom. That is hope. So if you look at the Old Testament lesson for today, we find God giving to man the gift of the Ten Commandments. They are not the Ten Suggestions. They are not the Ten Recommendations. They are the Ten Commandments of God. And God gave them to man for man's benefit. The Ten Commandments are the law, the curb, the mirror, and the rule. The curb that man can use so that man does not annihilate man. The mirror that man can use to see that we all sin like thought and word and deed, and need to have faith in Jesus the Savior and partake of his forgiveness of sins. The Ten Commandments are a rule, so you and I are going to wonder how in the world does God want me to live as a child of God, we have the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the Ten Commandments are the wisdom of God. The Ten Commandments are gospel imperatives. First, God tells us what he wants us to do. Then he sends us the Holy Spirit according to the gospel and our faith enabling us to do it. When we do it, we're living our life according to the way that God wants us to live our life. Loving the Lord our God, the heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbors ourselves. And then he showers us with blessing and benefits because we're doing what God wants us to do. This is the wisdom of God. And so if you want more blessings and benefits than your barns can hold, and your bride is to hold. You just try to live your life according to God's Ten Commandments. They are His Ten Commandments. They are His wisdom. As you live your life according to Ten Commandments, we do so because we're not trying to buy God's love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, or salvation. These are free gifts that God offers to us and to all people. We do it as a response of faith, not because we have to do it, but out of love because we want to do it. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. That's why God gives to us all of our money and all of our possessions so that we can serve our neighbor according to his need so that even our neighbor can be saved. That is God's wisdom. So it comes down to this. The Holy Spirit holds before you and me a choice today. So which way are you going to live your life? You're going to live your life according to God's wisdom, or are you going to live your life according to man's wisdom? Keep 
keep in mind that man's wisdom comes from man. Man comes from the dirt and dust of the ground. We return to the dirt and dust of the ground. Man's wisdom comes from the dirt and dust of the ground. It will return to the dirt and dust of the ground. It does not fulfill. It does not satisfy. It is emptiness and nothingness, just chasing after the wind. God's wisdom is the exact opposite of that. It gives to us God's wisdom, the way that God wants us to live, so you and I can be fulfilled and satisfied. So as you decide what choice you're going to make, whether you're going to live your life according to God's wisdom or man's wisdom, choose wisely. Do not choose poorly. Because it's got a huge impact upon you as you go through this lifeless world on this side of eternity. It also has a huge impact as to what's going to happen to you as you enter eternity and you pass away. So it's sort of like this. Jesus tells us this parable. There are once two great big mansions built by the river. One was built upon the foundation of solid rock. The wisdom of God. One was built upon the foundation of sand. The one that got washed into the river and was fully destroyed. So do not choose poorly. Choose well. Consider what an awesome God you and I have. A God who shares his wisdom with you and me. Our God, the triune God, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God that you and I can always trust in. Can always count on. Can always depend upon. Whose wisdom stands even for all of eternity. For you, for me, forever. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now the peace of God that passes with human understanding. May it be faithful and everlasting. Let us stand and sing the great in me.
Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their deeds, Lord, in your mercy, let a wife that makes it hair off, and daily fold it, and you beg you for your goodness for them, to be grateful in your mercy given unto them, strength, friends, relatives, pleasure of all, your gospel promise of peace and forgiveness. Dear Lord, as these your servants are the passing of one year and the beginning of a new year, for our confession works upon them through your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy, what a wife that Kurt Harrop, Judy Pullman, Wayne Needham, Sir Enfield, Deborah Abbey, I grace receive healing and strength from you. That they with us might be thankful in sickness and health. You might give the strength to accept your will for their gently to your lives, visit them in their afflictions, and empower them through your word and the promise of your love. Lord, in your mercy. All powerful creator, we praise you for blessing the earth and make it fruitful, bringing forth in abundance whatever is needed for the split of our lives. Cross we implore you the work of ranch farmers. Grant us a brother weather of sunshine and moisture. We both have a seed time and a gathering of the fruits of the earth, thus proclaiming your goodness with thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O oh Lord, we can all whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us continue with the service of the sacrament of the preface. Turn down to page 194 and then run to the hymnal. The Lord be with you. Is the new testament in my blood, which 
which he shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. They as soon as I be drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Savior Jesus Christ, you do have the forgiveness of all of your sins. Thank you, Dean, that you are our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you do have the forgiveness of all of your sins.
with body and soul to life everlasting. We part in his peace. Amen.